Hi, welcome to Educator. I'm Yvonne Galanen. Today we're going to go on a menopause skin road trip. Our destination is understanding what happens to your skin as a result of menopause. Our real goal is to free you from blame and guilt because there's really no room for either. So we're going to start the road trip five years before menopause and we're going to show how changes in body composition lead to a very altered fat tissue. The cells get bigger and fewer. They also change their behavior. And those behavioral changes lead directly to weak, frail skin. On this road trip, we have a guest. Riding shotgun is Babette Crowder, a 30-year veteran of the beauty industry. And she's going to lend her insight and color to this trip. Are you ready? Let's go. Hi, my name is Babette and I am an esthetician of 18 years. I'm also way past menopause <laughs> and I'm super excited to be here. I have retired from the beauty industry, which I was in for 33 years, starting to understand more uh, the connection of a pro-age person, you know, somebody who is 59 and how that is reflected or not reflected in society, how it makes other women feel. Because as you age, you may feel invisible and you may feel like the youth culture has taken over in a way you may not have realized before. I think what makes menopause so interesting, it's the intersection of several disciplines, endocrinology, metabolism, dermatology. It's not just one box. It's a dermatologist and an endocrinologist and your OBGYN. Looking at it like in a multifaceted way is just way more helpful. A few years before the menopause transition, you start seeing changes in body composition and changes in weight. Then all of a sudden, five years later, you see these rapid deterioration of skin fitness, more frail skin, saggier skin. Does that general arc resonate with you? I started perimenopause about 38 and I just noticed unexplained weight gain and irritability and just like all of a sudden this like feeling of overwhelming, like what's going on with my body and trying to figure that out. Also, it affects your self-esteem, right? You're like, what's happening? You know, what's happening? And, it seems yeah. like it's beyond your control. So here's the study, changes in body composition and weight during the menopause transition. And it's an all-star cast of academic medical centers and they're looking at longitudinal data and they assessed body composition by dual energy X-ray absorptiometry starting five years before the onset of menopause. You could see very modest gains in body weight and BMI starting about two years before menopause the fat composition of the body accelerated and you started to lose lean mass. And this continued for a couple of years and then flattened out. A very clear change in body composition with a relatively small change in body weight and BMI. I totally can identify with that because like, I know I should exercise, <laughs> But when you add other components in, like in my case, you know, uh, borderline bipolar or depression, anxiety, it just, you know, exacerbates that to, you know, the nth degree. But like you said, it's not my fault. And I think that is a very liberating message instead of like menopause is a terrible thing, blah, 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 blah. You're, you know, like it's almost like you're setting women up to fear this natural occurrence instead of like, hey, this is a part of the journey. The societal messages are that hormonal change is bad because it happens at the same time with aging. So we mm -hmm. sort of lump it together and we call it aging and then you feel bad about it and you feel like there's nothing you can do. The idea here today is to deconnect it. These physical changes occur and it's not aging, it's fitness. This paper 
discusses how estrogen affects energy balance. This paper brings together a ton of preclinical and clinical evidence. And the authors state very clearly, estrogens are known to regulate energy balance and weight homeostasis via effects on both food intake and energy expenditure. The most notable form of estrogen, 17-beta estradiol, regulates food intake along with classical hormones like leptin that influences whether you feel full or not. And here's something cool. In women, food intake is lowest during the periovulatory phase of the menstrual cycle when 17-beta estradiol levels are highest. On the other hand, estrogen influences resting energy expenditure, or REE. It's defined as the energy expended to maintain physiological functions essential to life. And this contributes approximately 60 to 70% of the total daily energy expenditure. The main factor determining resting energy expenditure is lean mass. And lean mass, in turn, is determined by energy expenditure. So to build lean mass, you need to exercise. And so really, estrogen reduces spontaneous physical activity. Rodent models show that removing the ovaries causes a decrease in spontaneous physical activity, which can be reversed by supplementing with estrogen. In addition, longitudinal studies have demonstrated that postmenopausal women are less likely to engage in physical activity than the same individuals prior to the menopause transition. And this effect is huge. It's like 40% reduction in physical activity. Loss of estrogen removes a control on eating, which is feeling full or satiety. And on the other hand, causes a reduction in spontaneous physical activity, which reduces lean body mass. Estrogen loss is affecting energy balance, energy in and energy out. That's really interesting. And so that's why you feel like you just want to eat and eat and eat. <laughs> and yeah, so. getting that trigger of getting full, like, oh, I need to stop when I'm full. I should have stopped 10 minutes ago versus, okay, now I feel really full. That's, that is so interesting. I had no idea. And here's the other thing, the loss of estrogen. It's actually also making it harder for you to build muscle. It has direct effects on muscle cells. I totally saw that, like total loss of tone and um, yep. just like more uh, flabby, I guess is the word. Not a flattering word, but. <laughs> yeah, and as if that wasn't enough. The estrogen modulates the two major fat tissues in the body, the subcutaneous mm. and the visceral. So this study is very provocative. Big name journal, scientific reports, and it discusses changes in abdominal, subcutaneous, adipose tissue following menopause. And they looked at both the subcutaneous and the visceral fat. And this is a small study. It's 33 women between the age of 45 and 60. They grouped these women into premenopause, perimenopause, and postmenopause. And you see the groups are small. The premenopausal group is 13 and the perimenopausal group is five. So this is a very, very, very small study, but it's biopsies, biopsies don't lie. We see the BMI increases, but not by a lot. Lean body mass decreases. Neither of these are statistically significant, but this is a small study and we can see a clear trend that mirrors what we saw in the first study that we looked at. Here's what's interesting. Here's what we didn't see in the previous study. You see the actual amount of abdominal subcutaneous adipose tissue in centimeters squared goes from 160 to 214 to 248. Massive increase in abdominal fat by 50%. And the visceral fat increases by even more, more than threefold. And as we saw in the previous review, the exercise capacity in these women decreased 
very significantly. So very statistically significant reduction in lung exercise capacity. And we see the physical activity also decreasing. It's not statistically significant because it's a small study, but we see it. We also see an increase in energy intake. Interestingly, much of the increase in energy intake is from carbohydrates. What they found was very clear cut. You see an increase in cell size in both the subcutaneous and visceral, and you see a decrease in cell number per kilogram of body fat. You see a reduction in adiponectin, a trend, not statistically significant. And you see an increase in inflammatory markers, IL-6, IL-18. So to summarize, the size of the cells is increasing, the number of cells is decreasing, and the inflammatory cytokines produced by the cells is increasing, and the beauty factor, adiponectin, is decreasing. And most people who have commented on the paper have commented on the development of the visceral fat. You know, visceral fat is, you may have heard from your doctor, it's the bad fat, mm -hmm. it's the, um, it's not bad fat. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just, it's just not very efficient fat. So the body develops visceral fat as a coping mechanism for insufficient subcutaneous. Got it. And I like how you just said that too. It's like, <laughs> not bad fat, right? It just is. And I think, again, that message that you share and that I believe is like, you know, no judgment, you know? Um, and I think, like I said before, you... Um, putting those two together is so liberating. Our bodies are always trying to do their best for us mm -hmm. and they're adapting. So now we're moving into discussing what's the connection with unfit fat and unfit skin. So this is one of my favorite papers. It's from Shiseido, Izor, and Amano, and they studied the effect of subcutaneous adipose tissue size on skin elasticity and sagging of the lower cheek. They measured the sagging of the cheek when subjects were seated by blinded observation. They also measured the skin, how much it gets pulled and how quickly and how much it bounces back. And they compared that with the size of the subcutaneous layer. And when they say subcutaneous layer, they're measuring everything from the dermis to the bone. So they're combining the dermal adipose tissue, which is here, and the subcutaneous. And their results couldn't be more clear cut. We're looking at UR, which is a measure of how much the skin bounces back and you want it to bounce back fully. And you see that as the amount of the subcutaneous adipose tissue increases, the amount that the skin bounces back decreases. And this bounce back can be explained just as well by subcutaneous adipose tissue as age. So you see 0 0.33, 0 0.30. So here they looked at sagging of the lower cheek and they showed that it's positively correlated with the thickness of the subcutaneous layer. The thicker it is, the more the lower cheek sags, and the sagging is negatively correlated with elasticity. The less elastic the skin, the more the cheek sags. So loss of estrogen is linked to loss of collagen, right? So how Indir does that... Indirectly, right. It's an indirect effect. And yeah. it's through, through the fat cells. So estrogen is affecting the fitness of the fat compartment. The fat compartment is affecting what the fibroblasts do. Right. Um, so it's and not... the fibroblasts, just to be clear, they're the ones that make are responsible for making collagen, correct? They make everything. They make the collagen. They make the hyaluronic acid. They make the elastin. Elastin. They make everything. Well, you know, I know that's another thing. I don't know how that related to loss of estrogen. I think it's related that all of a sudden you have hair. Like, I mean, in my knock on wood, it's very uh, fine. 
and um, almost impersonal and, and, you know, like a wax or something can take care of it. But um, yeah, all that's, of a sudden it just like popped up. Yeah. And that's, and, then, and that's because the hair and the fat cells have a symbiotic relationship. Life cycles are mutually dependent. They cycle together. So when you have dysfunctional fat, you're going to see a uh, hair either growth or lack of growth. And I just want to point out, we have not addressed the solutions. And why is that? You know, most YouTube, most <laughs> social media is very quick to offer a solution. But right. I think it's really important, as we've discussed, to really just understand what's going on. Right. Well, you know, the joke is if men had menopause, there'd be a pill and it wouldn't. <laughs> Sorry, but like you know, men, you know, we like to have like ready solutions to everything. Mm -hmm. But really, I think it's important for people to first before they look for a solution is make sure they understand really what's going on. Let's understand what causes what. We can restore fitness to everything. Let's consider an example where we can restore a lean body mass. We can improve the body composition and lose any potential extra weight. Then maybe we have a smaller problem for the hormone replacement to address. Maybe we can increase the therapeutic window and reduce the risks. I think the biggest thing that comes from understanding is that blame is completely disassociated, right? There's no blame. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think like I said before, that's a very liberating thought in the whole mindset of, you know, the circular, like, oh my gosh, I'm gaining weight, la, 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 that, you know, I can take care of my body the best I can, like eat properly, exercise, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, there's an underlying factor that I really have no control over. Yeah. And, and also like with exercise and diet and hormone replacement, if you start to think about, okay, how do you make it easier to lose weight, right? Or how do you make, make it easier for people to exercise? Or how do you make the effects of nutrition more impactful, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where you start to think about, okay, what's the balance? right, of maybe hormone supplementation with these other two um, lifestyle changes. Right. How, how, how can you combine all of them so that you're getting the best of each one? Right, and right. So I hope you enjoyed the road trip. I hope we've succeeded in building understanding. And I hope we've succeeded in eliminating any shred of guilt or blame about the effects of menopause on skin. It's just chemical changes. And once you understand them, you can take action. And I hope we broadened your understanding and deepened it. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. Your support has been tremendous. Thank you. See you soon.